so <clears throat> while we're getting that all set up, uh, I just wanted to give a background uh, briefly on what we're doing, uh, because I think it will provide some context then as we get, then dive back into the story about how we started and what we did. So um, Neighbor is, is based on this marketplace concept, which I know you all understand, but marketplaces, just to give you some context, are not, the marketplace business model is not necessarily a good business model. Uh, and I think we're starting to realize that the, you know, the more, the, with the proliferation of marketplaces across the US, you've probably seen a marketplace for just about every concept out there where there's, there's these distributed hosts and, and renters on a platform. But the, the reality is that most marketplaces fail. Uh, and the reason is because marketplaces only work at massive scale. Because if you think about it, Imagine you started a marketplace to share your lawnmower. And you, oh yeah, you uh, were, went around in Utah and you were able to get one person on with a lawnmower uh, that they're willing to rent out to someone else. And, are we good? Oh, awesome. And <clears throat> then you start spending ads and you get all these people coming on. And this lawnmower is located in, in Provo. And you get someone that gets on in Draper, and they're like, oh, cool, a website where I can rent someone else's lawnmower. And they pull it up, and you've got one listing, and it's this lawnmower in Provo. But who wants to drive down to Provo to pick up someone's lawnmower, take it back to Draper, uh, to mow their lawn, and then take it back? It just it doesn't work. It only works at scale. In fact. Marketplaces, the only marketplaces that do work are those that have what they call network effects. And that is the more users you get on the platform, the better it gets. It's the complete opposite business model that we're used to in Utah. Utah, we're super good at SaaS. So all, almost all the companies you, you know, you've heard of are these SaaS companies. Think Lucid and, and Pluralsight and, and uh, Instructure and Domo. Uh, it's, it's building a software product that you then go take to businesses and, and you sell it to those businesses. And, that, and your businesses are your customers. And what does the growth curve on a SaaS business look like? Well, there's some lag time to build your software, but let's just start once that software is, is built um, and baked. And if, as you can imagine, your software is most useful to this core group of companies, what you call your you know, your low hanging fruit. And so you build up a sales team and things are great, right? Like you're selling to all the people that absolutely need your software. So growth curve looks like this. And then at some point, uh, you know, you have to start selling to those people who your software's not the most perfect fit for. And it gets harder and harder to sell. And, and now you've been around for, for five years and maybe 10 years. And it's like, okay, who, who do we sell to? You know, we're, we're running out of businesses that it's an easy fit to sell to. And you start spending more and more on sales. Um, and you run out of customers to sell to. And you're a $2 billion company, so what do you do? You IPO or you sell or something. That's, I, I'm being a little bit degrading to the sales life, to the SaaS life cycle because I'm not a SaaS company. Uh, it's a great business model. Utah's done it really successfully. But consumer marketplaces work in the complete opposite way. Rather than having this early, really fast, awesome growth, and then it kind of leveling off as it gets harder and harder to sell, consumer marketplaces, they, uh, a as I mentioned, when you just have one user on your platform, your platform's worthless. And when you have 10 users on your platform, your platform's worthless. And when you have 100 users on your platform, your platform's worthless. And so it's this, it's this slow, slow growth. And if you go look at, go like Google image growth of Airbnb or something, and it, it just looks like this. And then it reaches these inflection points where it starts to be there's critical mass in market where you get on and there's actually more storage options than there are, you know, for neighbor storage options. But let's take Airbnb. There's actually more hotel options than there are hotels. And so it gets really easy to find the perfect hotel right where you need it at the right price point because there's all this competition in the marketplace. And then things start to really take off, and it just explodes. 
and it's kind of this reverse trajectory. So the SaaS trajectory and then the marketplace trajectory. So I want to give you that background and then just give you a little details on like why Neighbor works. Why is Neighbor one of those marketplaces that works? And then we'll take a step back and like go into the story. So uh, what do I need? Uh, here, I'll just click it. Um, so one, we operate in this massive uh, market. So who knew that there was more storage facilities in the US than all of those locations combined? To give you uh, some context, and this is just the locations. Like, There's about 14,000 McDonald's in the US. There's 50,000 storage facilities. Uh, and then each of those facilities has like 400 units inside. Uh, there's like 30 million storage units in the United States. Um, and despite the fact that we've built so many, and the reason you've never seen them is because they don't have big signs with big golden arch M's on them. So that's why I compare them to restaurants, because you know like, but even though there's so many, they're all occupied, 93% occupied on average. Uh, and the industry, of course, has been trying to build to catch up to that. Uh, last year it went up again to five and a half billion dollars spent just in one year on new storage facility construction. And, and what's supposed to happen is that green line is supposed to start coming down, right? Because you build enough storage facilities, maybe occupancy will come down. But yet, even though they're supposed to be inversely correlated, they just keep going up with each other. Next slide. And, th and that's been going on for a long time. Storage has actually been the fastest growing segment in commercial real estate for four decades straight now. Uh, one in 10 American families now leases a storage unit. So if you look around, 10% uh, of this class their family uh, leases a storage unit. But it's not because it's a good solution. It's because it's the only solution. Like, people hate their storage units. They, they you know, have to pay these exorbitant prices because they can charge that. Uh, and they don't get insurance. They're super unsafe. Over 50% of storage facilities don't even have security cameras. Most people don't know that if the facility burns down, you're on the hook for your items. They don't cover it. You're on the hook. So it's this industry that's kind of like massive and just ripe for disruption. Next slide. Um, to give you an idea, well, trivia question, go back. I gave away the answer, but who wants to take a guess of what the, uh, take all the tech companies in Utah and, and all the other companies, what's the single largest company in the state of Utah? Extra space storage. Extra space storage. You can go back to the answer slide. Uh, $15 billion market cap based out of Cottonwood Heights, Utah. That is the largest company in the state of Utah. Um, and you can see the multiples these guys are getting. Uh, I'm sure you studied this in your classes. Is, is it's better than most tech companies, right? Like 2.7 billion in revenue and a $43 billion market cap. That's because they're basically just like US mints. They just print cash off. They have 60% net profit margin. The nice thing for us, though, is that we're coming into this space and unlike an Airbnb that had to attack this big industry with these concentrated Marriott's and Hilton's that owned massive market share, 85% of this market share is just mom and pop storage facilities. Anyway, that's the background I wanted to give you. We're gonna, I'm gonna buzz through these real quick. Well, blue screen of death. So, <coughs> I want to I uh, take you back to, here, I'm just going to skip a bunch of this stuff real quick. Yep. So one way we could tell this timeline is to say, you know, 2017, neighbor founded. 2019, we have users in all 50 states. Uh, 2020, we just raised from uh, Andreessen Horowitz, arguably the best investor in the world, and uh, they made their first investment in, into Utah ever. Um, they're on the boards of Airbnb and, and Instacart and Pinterest and all these other marketplaces. Huge benefit to neighbor. Uh, and 2020 and beyond, you know, we're going to become the next unicorn. That's like one way to tell this. 
But that's not the way I want to tell this, because this is how this story always gets told. Uh, and it's just not the reality. We could, we could make Neighbor look like this awesome company, but that's not, that's not how these companies get built. So I'm going to take you all the way back to 2015. Um, I had just gotten back from my mission. And um, uh, shortly after getting back from my mission, I came back to BYU. Uh, I got engaged, as happens. I got, uh, and I was engaged, and I was like, okay, now I'm engaged. I need to like start thinking about a job. I had gone to some school before my mission, so I had about two years left. Um, <coughs> and I found out about this thing called consulting, and I applied. And as I got into it, I was like, consulting is the greatest thing ever to, you know, to grace mankind. I thought it was so cool. And I, I, I specifically applied to Bain and Company. And my fiance at the time, uh, we just thought this was the most Im important thing. And we, we prepared together. We fasted and prayed together. And I got an interview. And I was so ecstatic to get an interview. Um, I had known people that had been, you know, preparing for this for, you know, a year. And here I was, like, a, a few weeks off my mission, and I'd gotten an interview with one of these, these consulting firms. And <coughs> um, the, day, the day before that interview, I remember Chloe and I, um, you know, got together, and we fasted. And, and we felt a very strong impression that, uh, I was supposed to go to, to Bain and Company, and that that was the right thing for our family, and that we were going to move to Dallas. And this was just for an internship. I interviewed, and two weeks later, you can go to the next slide. Um, I got it. Uh, and we were so excited to go out there. This was during my summer out at Bain and Company. I thought it was so cool to have my own desk and my own laptop, and, and really enjoyed the summer. And at the end of that summer, uh, I got done. I uh, and the very last day, they pulled me into an office and they handed me an offer. And I had had so much fun that summer, I signed it on the spot. Uh, I didn't even, you know, forget like negotiation tactics or whatever. I like, they, they handed it to me, I pulled a pen out, signed it, gave it back to them. Um, that's how excited I was to go to Bain & Company. Plus, my, my now wife and I, had had you know strong impressions about you know going to Bain and Company, um, but when I got back to school for my senior year at BYU, I had a good friend, a guy by the name of Preston Alder, who approached me, and he said. Uh, so Preston, one thing you should know about him is he had this little video marketing company. He put himself through school filming content for these big companies. And he said, over the summer, I had to fly down to South America to film content for three or four months. Uh, and this was while I was at Bain. He was down in South America. And he said, while I was down there, I needed to get a storage unit for my item. And I looked into getting a storage unit, and it was just untenable. Like, I was going to have to drive a half hour to Springville to find one that even had availability. And they were going to charge me several hundred dollars a month, and it was for this dirty unit. So I ended up storing with a friend. I had a friend that was super nice who said, yeah, you can store in my garage. And he said, when I got back, I went to pick my items up from that garage, and I just thought, this was such a better solution. The space was much cleaner. It was much nicer. I felt more peace of mind about my items while I was gone, being stored in this nice uh, garage instead of a storage facility. And it ended up being a lot cheaper for me as a student. I think that there needs to be some sort of uh, directory or something or garages. And I was like, that sounds like the coolest idea I've ever heard. Uh, I've heard people pitch business ideas, but I just thought that was the coolest thing I'd ever heard. But I said, that's awesome, Preston. Um, maybe someday someone will start that. <laughs> and he went to class, and I went to class. Uh, 
little did I know, uh, he started, he, he couldn't get it out of his mind. I was like, I'm going to Bain. He had actually uh, lined up a full-time job and accepted a full-time job with DaVita, DaVita Consulting. So we're both going to go do consulting, me in management consulting and, and him in healthcare consulting. So he also lined up a job. So he was like, yeah, next summer I'm going to, but, but let's, let's just experiment with this idea. And he started tinkering around with names um, and other, other things for what this company could be called and like how you would run the processes. And <clears throat> at the end of that semester, Preston and I started talking again. And he said, you know, I've, st I've, I've, been, I've put some work into this idea. And I actually talked one of the professors in the strategy program um, into letting me use my company as one of the projects, as one of the semester projects. And I was about to take that class. And I said, well, I still think your idea is the best idea I've ever heard in my entire life. C you know, uh, can I just work on it with you full time? Like, I'm so excited to work on this with you. Uh, and, we, and we started working on it together. And he had a third, uh, next slide here. He had a friend that uh, he'd been mission companions with that also started working on it. So Preston and I, we knew each other. This is the strategy class of 2017 picture. We had taken a bunch of classes together. His wife went to Bain, I went to Bain. We knew each other really well. We'd done a bunch of projects together. Uh, and we just had a mutual respect. Preston's one of the most high integrity people I've ever met in my life. Um, and so we started working on this idea. And I, I remember going in home and, and telling my wife that I was gonna start working on this company. And she was like, okay, it's your last semester of school. Uh, you're taking 18 credits. We already have a baby. I'm in school. Uh, you have a job uh, outside of school in Salt Lake that you work 20 hours a week. Why would you take another job? And I said, because Preston's my favorite person to work with in the entire world. Uh, and she said, well, don't you like being with me too? And I said, absolutely. Uh, <laughs> and as soon as I graduate, we'll be together so much. <laughs> um, but she was... She was awesome and really supportive. Um, and we uh, put in place practices to make it work um, where, you know, we maintained, and, and this was super important because, you know, that last semester got so busy. We made it a point that we would never go uh, a day without reading the Book of Mormon. And that time together really helped us uh, be one during that time. You, you, I don't know that I've had too many times in my life that were more busy than that semester. Starting a company, and 18 credits, and a full-time job. But uh, we always read the Book of Mormon together. And sometimes that meant that she would be finishing her homework uh, you know, at 1 p.m. and uh, or 1 a.m., and we would have to make 15 minutes to, to sit down and read the Book of Mormon together, but we always did, and it made it so much more doable. It was never a, a time for us where we felt like other priorities were creeping into our lives. Um, so <clears throat> during that time, we put up this, this really beautiful website. Uh, that you can see here, with a really beautiful name. So we couldn't get the domain neighbor.com, so instead we bought for $1.99, neighbor.com. <laughs> um, and as you can see, you can put in your email address and your zip code and tell us what you're interested in, in renting out. And the way we made this work was when we would get someone that said he's interested in renting his space out and someone that's interested in paying rent, we would call one of them and we'd say, hey, uh, I see you're interested in renting your space out. How much would you like to charge? 
and they would sell us, you know, a hundred dollars a month. So we'd call the renter on our list. This populated an Excel spreadsheet on the back end. It just went into a Google sheet. And we'd call the renter and we'd say, hey, we have a space available. So and so wants to charge a hundred dollars a month. When what would you like to store? Okay, you want to store um, 10 boxes. And then we'd call back the other person and we'd say, hey, so-and-so wants to store 10 boxes. When can they move in? And then we'd call back the other person and we'd say, hey, so-and-so uh, says you can move in at this time. And they'd say, great. And so we'd send them both contracts. And then we'd say to the renter, Venmo us $120. And then we'd say to the host, what's your Venmo? And we'd Venmo them out $100. It was completely manual. And we did this for several months, where it was totally manual with this basic website. And we only built things as they became necessary. So there came a point where there was no longer like enough time in the day to call, you know, the people, it was just becoming too much work to do all these phone calls. So we upgraded our website to where you could, you could get on and you could see spaces and you could book it, but you still couldn't do the payments. Well, when we started processing enough payments, Venmo started shutting our, our Venmo accounts down. Uh, my co-founder to this day cannot use Venmo uh, because it's against your terms of service to use it for a business. So it became necessary to build payment processing into our website, so we did. And as you can see, here's just some, some early you know, versions kind of progressing up. Like the website has seen many different iterations and here's kind of like what you'll see if you go on our website today. Um, but we have tested and tested all sorts of different things. This was when our app first rolled out. It was just two you know, things on the bottom your spaces and your profiles. Um, <coughs> and it also meant that a lot of the processes we had to take care of ourselves. So I had this picture. This picture on the left was the items of a renter in one of our host spaces. Well, one thing we hadn't contemplated is what happens when a host moves out, um, which happened with these items that you see here. And so that host moved out, and they needed those renter's items gone, and we didn't have anywhere to put them. So this was my living room. <laughs> and you can see, you know, next to my table, someone else's mattress against the wall. And if I showed you the other side of the living room, all of those boxes were just stacked up in our living room, and we were, like, walking around. Because we hadn't figured out how to handle this yet, but we needed to service our customers. Um, as far as servicing our customers, you can see our, our customer success chat line. Uh, and a site visitor, unnamed, doesn't want to upload a picture of their driver's license or passport, which we require in order to sign up on the platform. Uh, so you can see uh, I had to take some time to answer those support tickets. Like all of our support tickets and all of our support was done originally by the three founders, and we only uh, you know, Scott was just talking to me uh, right before the class started, and we were talking about office space, and he was saying, only grow when your business forces you to grow, right? Don't, don't grow the team until you absolutely have to. And I think that's some of the best advice uh, that a startup could possibly have. The biggest cause of death among startups is not the business idea not working out. It's spending the money you have and going bankrupt. Um, a lot of businesses, if they would keep burn lower, uh, they would, uh, with time, they would be successful. But they spend all the money they have and they go out of business. So these are, again, some examples of what we like to call doing things that don't scale. That term comes from a, a Y Combinator uh, Paul Graham article, and he said, Businesses in their early stages should do things that don't scale. 
So then, <clears throat> this is still our, the last semester of our senior year. This is early 2017. We started competing in local business competitions. Uh, and I was, I was going to include a picture of our, our Miller New Venture Challenge, but I was just throwing this together like 30 minutes before class started. Um, and you can see uh, we started competing, and, and we got valuable feedback. A lot of business competitions that we competed in, we lost. We said, this is a sucky idea. Uh, you, this will never go anywhere. And you guys are idiots. And we said, we know. Trust us. But w you know, how can we make it better? Uh, but in some of them, we started doing well. And we started to win a little bit of money here and there. We're talking $5,000 here, $10,000 here. And we would use that money to test ads. We had this website, but we would use that money to like run little ad tests to see you know, if, if we actually pay to get users on our platform, how do they sign up? What's their behavior? And this all culminated in the BYU Miller New Venture Challenge, which we competed in, and we're lucky enough to be awarded $15,000 from, which we thought was a ton of money at the time. We were like, okay, so we can last like 10 years now. <laughs> um, but even more important probably than the $15,000, was the Miller New Venture Challenge gave us office space. So Neighbor's first headquarters, uh, our first international global headquarters, was in this building, um, in a room that we had a lock and key to, up on the, what was it, second floor, third floor? Third floor. And we went to this room all day. And we lived here. We had food here. like that we could eat alongside the walls. You can see underneath the chairs, there's just like boxes of stuff to eat. And we, we would stay here from the morning till the night, uh, working on neighbor. And you can see that um, we had problems, right? Like that's the one note I was able to capture in these photos is website problems, which if you looked at our whiteboard today, it probably still says the same thing, website problems. But one of the ways we made it work, the reason I like these photos is because we just said, look, we're going to be, we're in for a, a hard uh, few years. How do we make this manageable? How do we make entrepreneurship manageable? And one of the rules we've always had, it's one of our core values at Neighbor, is to promote community and family. And one of the ways we promote community and family is families are always allowed in the office. Um, so even though we know we're going to be at the office a lot, uh, families are welcome to come anytime because they're part of the team. And I was going to put up here some texts showing uh, our wives sending ideas about how to build neighbor and us like discussing those, those ideas. Family, I, I, I feel like it's been a competitive advantage that we've involved our families in the building of neighbor because it, it created a diversity of perspective um, that helped us build our company, and it also helped the whole family feel involved. Now, the last thing you want is to be working on something that is so time-consuming and for it to feel siloed and one person to be working on it and the other uh, not working on it. So this was our first child who we had, Alex. Um, and uh, she often, she was a frequenter of the, the office. Um, you can see, you know, some early examples of website mock-ups. Uh, it didn't start out pretty, but this is like profile page with a person head. Um, and ideas about how to get hosts and how to get renters or the flows for those. So it's, it really did start out so primitive. Um, now, during that uh, Miller New Venture Challenge, there happened to be some investors in the audience. And after we competed in the Miller New Venture Challenge, those investors asked us if, they would if we would come visit with them. And we did. We went to go visit with them. And <clears throat> in the meantime, uh, right about the time we did the Miller New Venture Challenge, we all got together and we all called our jobs and, and quit, told them we weren't coming. So I called Bain and Company and said, hey, Bain, uh, I'm not going to show up this summer full time. And they said, OK, send us back your signing bonus. And so I wrote them a check. 
and Preston called DeVita Healthcare, and Colton was actually already working full-time at Cicero Group up in Salt Lake City, and he quit and started working full-time at Naval. But these investors had asked us to come in, and they uh, started talking to us and said, we think you've really got something um, great. Would you be interested in raising money? And I think we were in Scott's office a few times talking about this, but we told them, no, we're not interested in raising money. We've got $15,000 from the new venture fund. We're solid. We're rich. Um, no, but what we said is, is we're raising a convertible note. So for those of you who don't know, there's a, a financing vehicle called a convertible note where people can put dollars in without pricing it, without getting equity in return yet. They just get a promise that their equity, that their dollars will convert into equity at the next round. And we thought, hey, if we can take some non-dilutive capital now uh, and build this out, then we can raise it a higher valuation later this year. And we had talked through our advisors about that. And Pelion and, and what was then Peak Ventures, they said, well, what if we make it bigger than you could ever raise in a convertible note. And so we said, okay, uh, we're interested. So we ended up raising two and a half million dollars from Pelion and Peak Ventures. I put some of the texts and emails about how that got raised here just because I thought it'd be interesting to see. It ends up happening a lot on like informal conversations more than you think of like, hey, you know, we want to talk about new terms. I'm, I'm, I'm sure um, Scott could talk about this, but uh, literally, we were discussing things over text message. And the thing you have to remember about investors when you go to raise for your companies are that they're people too. Uh, they want to find the next great company. They're interested in, in finding the right, oh yeah, there's that check out at the Damon Company. Um, they're interested in finding the right opportunities. And so it's important to do what's right for them and to do what's right for you. Uh, and, and we were always respectful of investors, but we also told them what we were looking for and what kind of outcome we were looking for. As part of raising money, we were able to move out of the Tanner building and move into Pelion Ventures' office. They incubated us. That was our second office space. And as you can see, we maintained our rule about allowing families to come. And I showed this display up here just to highlight again what we tried to do. We, uh, this is at Disneyland, so I'm obviously not working, but we tried to bring work with us uh, everywhere we went, because that's what you have to do as a startup, but we also pro tried to bring family with us to work. So a lot of people will talk about work-life balance and like we need to spend certain times. Well, really what you have to do is you need to do family all the time and uh, this is my opinion, my perspective. You should do family all the time, and you should do work pretty much all the time if you're going to do a startup. Um, but it's not about segmenting or splitting or competing. And you should vacation all the time. <laughs> no. Um, I know we're getting close to time, but the other thing I wanted to talk about was relying on advisors. And these were some of the advisors we got uh, through the Miller New Venture Challenge here at BYU. So the Miller New Venture Challenge placed us with a guy named Mike Dutton. He was our, our assigned advisor. And as you can see, Mike Dutton introduced us to a guy named Jonathan Johnson, who is the CEO of Overstock. Jonathan ended up becoming an investor in the company. And he introduced us to a guy named Jeremy Andrus, who uh, was at Skull Candy and now runs Traeger Grove. So one of the biggest things we did that I thought made us successful early on was we said, we don't know how to build a business. We just don't. We're not the smartest people in the world. But there are a lot of people that do know how to build a business. And if we can leverage them, then we can be successful. And so we've relied heavily on advisors. And the best kind of advisors are these types, those that are willing to give their advice for free. Um, I think there's something wrong. You know, as, as you start to build a business, you'll inevitably have people approach you 
and say, hey, I think you're building a great business. I'd like to provide some advice to your business, and I'd like you to give me some equity in return. I don't think that's ever appropriate. I don't think you should ever do it. People should be willing to give of their advice freely. Uh, because Jonathan and Jeremy and, and Mike gave us free advice for all that time, anyone that's ever reached out to Neighbor, I've been happy to talk to them about their business uh, and give whatever insight I can. You can see that Dave Royce, who also uh, the Miller New Venture Challenge introduced us to, literally was willing to dive in and give us advice on the copy, the, 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 the words on a flyer, a door hanger flyer that was going to go out to thousands of doors around Utah. Because Dave has built a company, Aptiv, that uh, is very successful at the door-to-door -door, uh, marketing. And so th he, he just called us up and said, hey, I heard you guys are doing some of this stuff. Can I please help you guys do it better? Um, and that's the beauty of the BYU community is that there's so many people willing to do this. Um, so today, I would love to tell you we're in some you know, massive building, but this is Neighbors Headquarters. I wanted to show you guys because it's really important to us. We believe that we are spreading neighborliness everywhere. There's something amazing about having this face-to-face -face transaction through our platform. People think they've become more connected through Facebook and through Instagram, um, but they haven't. Or really, they become less connected. But we have users write us in, and, and we're, one of the things I'll say is we're one of the first hyper-local marketplaces in the world. So if you think of like an Airbnb, you stay with someone in Thailand, it's a great multicultural experience, but you're probably never going to see that, that host in Thailand again, right? But on Neighbor, when you go on as a renter, our renters literally look for the space closest to them because that's going to be the most convenient to go access their items. It's going to be the, uh, the, the least driving time, et cetera, and they're going to feel the safest because it's in their own neighborhood. And so we have users write in, and they'll say, I've said hi to my neighbor, uh, for 10 years now, but never really developed a relationship. But the other day, I had to go move my items into their garage, and it forced us to have this conversation for like an hour and a half. And I realized uh, they're a Republican and I'm a Democrat, and we don't hate each other. And so we really believe in this, this Mr. Rogers concept of neighborliness, and we've tried to stick to that. And I think it's made us successful. So again, building a company in the Utah way, we've tried to be frugal in our office space, uh, uh, we thought we had found the perfect place ever when we found this. It's got the tree and the brick color and the sloped roof, uh, just like my, Mr. Rogers House. And that strong culture is, as the team has grown beyond three founders to now, I think, almost 15 people on our team, uh, those people don't come with all the experience of founding the company. So how do they, how do they stay strong to the vision? Well, little things like this, as you go on to found your own companies, are important. There's a reason everyone at Google still talks about that garage that they were founded in, uh, or some of the early um, things that they did. You have to have things that make you unique and make you you. Uh, building a company is not about, it can't just be about making money. Uh, and so going back to that original slide, that I put up there, so many people tell their story about, you know, we were founded, neighbor reached all 50 states, we raised from some of the top investors, but at the end of the day, that's not motivating to people over the long term. What's motivating to people is making a difference. It's things like building a company that pays 50% of people's mortgages every single month with passive income. It's things like saving renters one to two thousand dollars a year by switching. Um, it's things like building a company that will bring neighbors together and build these hyper-local communities. And it's helped us define our vision too. We know that we want to uh, disrupt the storage industry, but beyond that, we want to leverage the power of community to solve other needs. And so what if, uh, you know, we build all these public schools everywhere? What if 10 years from now, 
neighbor uses its strong community resources to allow people to share their pool, uh, for example. And instead of going to the public pool, you can pay your neighbor a little bit to let you come over and use their pool. And that way they can invest a little bit more in their pool and build a bigger, nicer pool that will accommodate lots of people in the neighborhood. What if neighborhoods could really solve all of our problems and rather than going outside to these big external companies, we could just rely on each other. And those types of things uh, really inspire people to build a great company over the long term. So that's what I wanted to end with. Um, those were other pictures I was going to try and put in. But I wanted to save some time for questions. <laughs>